we move on to the next component of this particular module dealing with special ecosystems and we come up with one of the other unique ecosystems which is referred to as wetlands wetlands and water bodies wetlands they as one may be aware is celebrated on 2nd of february every year this was the day when the convention on wetlands of international importance especially as water found habitats which was made in the year 1971 in the iranian city of ramsar that's why it's also called as the ramsar convention or the wetlands convention if you look at the unique feature of this particular international arrangement this is perhaps the first modern international treaty arrangement devoted entirely for the protection and conservation of a particular type of an ecosystem the flora and fauna that are dependent upon it there are 170 odd countries which are parties to it india is also one of the earliest which are signatories to this and all over the world there are over 2300 wetlands that are inscribed on the ramsar list which comprises over and spread over 250 million hectares of land area by the year 2018 what exactly are wetlands if you look to the convention it comes up with this description that these are areas which are marshy which are peat lands having water in them which may be a natural formation or something that has been man made it may even be a permanent one or a temporary water body with water that is static or it may even be flowing fresh brackish or salt water including areas of marine water the depth of which at low tide does not exceed 6 meters so these are by and large a half a house between land and water they have substantial quantity of water in them but they have features of land as well in them like lakes and water tanks and the major examples that we have in india are the dal lake in kashmir and chirika lake in odisha why there should have been an international arrangement in this regard and why should 170 odd countries show interest in it and become parties to this arrangement what is their significance these are very special ecosystems they are important because they perform a variety of ecological services like water purification water storage for use during dry periods of time they act as natural barriers to floods they recharge groundwater help control soil erosion provide habitats for animals and plants block provide food and fodder for livestock conserve biodiversity of great recreation value they literally serve as the kidneys of earth they clean up water they have very great ecological significance and value and they support provision for food and meeting certain the livelihood requirements of the local people and so an international legal arrangement came into existence looking at their importance and value even in maintaining ecological balance that was the ramsar convention of 1971 this convention is a legal frame a award for cooperative efforts among member countries to protect wetlands and the benefits derived by the people from them it actually creates three sets of obligations for each of the parties to this arrangement number 1 each member country has to designate sites 
at least one in each territory as wetlands of international importance. This is the first requirement. The second requirement being a party, they have to apply what is called as the wise use concept. Wise use, that means local and national actions and international cooperations for its sustainable development, which includes water, livelihoods, biodiversity, disaster, risk reduction, resilience and carbon sinks, all integrated in a management plan. And third, to engage in international cooperation. It's a very special law because no legal sanctions exist for non-observance. It is essentially rooted to voluntary undertaking by the states of the obligations that are spelt out in this international legal arrangement. Because these are areas within the territory of any single state. And so the sovereign right of any kind of use by the state remains intact and it is undisturbed. But once you become a party, you have a commitment. Supposing this wetland is to be used for some other purpose, then you have an obligation and you commit for that to come up with a compensatory alternative site created for this purpose so as to substitute for a wetland that has already been put to a different kind of a use. Coming to India, if you just look at the national efforts, legal efforts in this regard, there was hardly any till the year 2010. Although we were one of the earliest supporters of this arrangement way back in 1971, having ratified it within a couple of years, the legislative backup did not come to this till the year 2010. Then what did we do? between 1971 to 2010. In fact, most of the national efforts were either some kind of an administrative plan or a program like National Wetland Conservation Program, NWCP, that was unleashed in the year 1986, 15 years after the convention. And under that, there are 37 sites in India declared as wetlands of international importance. They are protected under the six strict guidelines of the convention. But the irony is, India has over 4 lakh wetlands, which actually covers nearly 4 to 5 percent of the entire country's area. But none of these are notified under any other domestic laws for protection by the states. In fact, judiciary, which has taken note of this, and it has attempted to fill in the vacuum through a number of pronouncements that have actually literally steered the wetlands governance in India. And for this, in the reading material, a, a wonderful chronological account of a Chilika Lake case study has been given and the students are required to go through just to understand as to how this developed over a period of time in India. And also a very important case which is illuminating about the idea of wetlands, how they have to be conserved and protected in a case decided by the Kolkata High Court. The case is People United for Better Living in Kolkata versus State of West Bengal. It was a 1993 decision. It's a classic decision which actually highlights the importance of wetlands and a kind of an instruction to the administration not to tamper with it. So, between 1971 to 2010, this was the position. And for the first time in the year 2010, the wetlands conservation and management rules were enacted for the purpose of the protection of the wetlands. And these later, 10 years later, just this year, in the year 2020, a wetland conservation management rules replaced the 2010 rules. What are its major features? Under these rules, setting up of or expansion of industries and disposal of construction and demolition waste within wetlands are totally prohibited. Each state and union territory is required to set up an authority 
to evolve strategies for conservation and wise use. Number two, to prepare a list of all wetlands within three months. Number three, develop a comprehensive list of activities for regulation or restriction in the areas and zones of their influence and recommend mechanisms for maintenance of their ecological character through promotional activities in the notified areas. A web portal is established for sharing of information and the documents are uploaded from time to time by both the central and state government both for information and for its retrieval and use. So, under these rules, the primary role and responsibility of declaration, identification, maintenance and management of the wetlands are there with the state government. The center providing information and technological assistance to them for such a purpose. Unfortunately, these rules, both the 2010 and the latest 2020, do not really make any mention of recovery of encroached wetlands because these are very soft targets for encroachers, for people, for their private interests because it is a public resource and unattended to, uncared for and things like that. And if the state does not take much attention to it, then it is subject to encroachment. It is also quite possible that the government may also at times, because there are no regulations which are actually going to be implemented in these areas, may use it for a different purpose altogether. And so, the recovery of those last wetlands, this law does not make any mention of it. In fact, the student is advised to refer to a decision given by the Supreme Court in the year 2011, the Jackpal Singh versus Punjab, which makes a pointed reference that states in the center should make earnest efforts in recovering the last wetlands. And these rules, unfortunately, are silent about that. The institutional arrangements for implementation, monitoring their compliance, actions for violations, and resolution of conflicts in this regard are left, the state, left to the states to manage and to take care. And the states have been a little bit ambivalent in putting this into application unless there is some kind of an international funding or national funding. States have invariably been lax in putting into operation those guidelines and rules that are framed for this purpose. Very closely related to this is the development with regard to the water bodies. Water bodies like lakes and tanks, which are once again uh, the state subjects under the constitution for lawmaking and the center having a very limited role except offering model and draft bills for the consideration and adoption by the states. Here, the center many a time have come up with innovative methods. Since the center has no direct role, what they do is they offer assistance to the states under some project, under some scheme, under some kind of an international funding or anything like that by making budgetary allocations to the states. Look, we are going to provide you money, we are going to provide you assistance under this particular plan or a project, but we laid on a certain set of conditions for protection, maintenance, management and sustainable development of these water bodies. If you follow these conditions, here are our assistance available to you. And accordingly, they have even drafted model bills for accommodation and application by the states in case of lakes and water bodies. Since there is no specific central law for environmentally sustainable management of lakes and water bodies, <clears throat> and states also having their own piecemeal approach for water bodies like fisheries law, and being a common property resource, the aquatic ecosystem lacks both uniform policy and law for its protection. However, the central intervention has come from the environmental angle, like in the case of wetlands, mainly because of the higher judiciary has intervened and 
There are cases like Ajay Singh Rawat versus Union of India decided by the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court looking into the pathetic state of the very acclaimed Nainital Lake, it remarked, look at this beautiful lake. It is a beautiful butterfly that had turned into an ugly caterpillar and had urged the centre and the state governments to implement remedial measures under the supervision of a committee. There is also another case decided by the Supreme Court in 1997. It's MC Mehta versus Union of India. It is with regard to Bhatkal and Surajkund Lake in which the court applied the principle of precaution. Please stop certain land developmental activities which affect the carrying capacity of these ecosystems. So it is urging, prompting, goading, guiding, directing, instructing by the Supreme Court and the High Courts from time to time, which actually led to a number of measures unleashed by the central government. And one such was started in the year 2001, the National Lake Conservation Plan, NCLP for short, to conserve and manage polluted and degraded lakes in urban and semi-urban areas. The provision for central assistance was made for the states to conserve and sustainably manage these lakes. This was followed by a set of guidelines for national conservation of lakes, a plan for national lake conservation in the year 2008. And this is to help the states to prepare a detailed project report. It emphasized the responsibility of states to work in partnership with the center to ensure protection, conservation and sustainable management of lakes. This was later found a little cumbersome because you had a separate set of plans with regard to lakes and water bodies. You had a separate set of uh, rules and guidelines evolved in relation to uh, wetlands. <clears throat> the government thought it fit to merge these two and they came up with what is called as the National Plan for Conservation of Aquatic Ecosystems, NC, NPCA. It is a centrally sponsored scheme implemented by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change to promote better synergy and avoid overlap of administrative functions in relation to lakes and wetlands. A very logical step. It seeks to mainstream aquatic ecosystems in a developmental paradigm where the works funded under the two set of activities are synergized and are made to dovetail and strengthen the institutional arrangements at the state level. Well, the rules for wetland conservation and this particular national plan that has been mentioned just now present an idea of a wonderful blueprint for conservation, wise use and development of this very special ecosystem. The ground reality unfortunately is still far from approximating in realizing the very aspiration of the wetlands convention and so many expectations expressed and spelt out from time to time by the judiciary. In brief, it can be said that the legal evolution, the plans and programs of the center and the state governments, they remain a work in progress not having accomplished the mission set for itself a long way to go. With this, we complete three segments of our discussion on the coastal zone, the ecologically sensitive zones and wetlands. We move on to the last segment of our inquiry and that is water bodies, water law, and water governance.